David, thank you so much. It is really lovely to be back here with all of you. I really think of the Fox Valley Conservative Forum and the folks up here in Appleton and the, the surrounding area as my uh, second grassroots family. Wisconsin 912 obviously is my first, but you guys really are my second family. So thanks for welcoming me back for the third time. I'm delighted to be here. Um, um, I should be, I, uh, I guess, do I, need, do I need both of them? Is this, is this on? Yay, okay, well, all right, then I can do both. I just want to make sure I'm not providing feedback (laughs) for people because I'm being recorded and they need to be amplified. Um, So, uh, again, I'm just delighted to be here with all of you. Um, As as David told you, I started my own publishing company about a year and a half or getting close to two years ago now, Resounding Books, and I did it in sort of an interesting way. I... um, I didn't do it as a regular business. I did it as a PAC, a political action committee, with the idea that the profits from some of the projects that I would do would go back into activism, into fighting um, on behalf of or against causes that we published on. And I'm proud to be able to tell you that the uh, monies that would have gone for royalties to contributors to this volume are instead being pooled for Common Core activism, um, in this, like literally across the United States, we're going to be doing some mini grants with this. So that's really exciting. So when you purchase the book, you're actually contributing to activism, not just um, getting a great reading experience. Um, a lot of people have asked me why I would do this. Um, you know, David's question is, is sound. Why, why would uh, those of us who consider ourselves to be more um, on the conservative or libertarian uh, portion of the political spectrum, why would we uh, want to be talking to people who identify on what they think of as the left or what we think of as the left? Um, how does that work? We're at each other's throats, it seems, for uh, on almost everything. Why and how it, would it be possible even to forge a relationship and get something done uh, on Common Core? Well, as it turns out, this is not a partisan issue. And we actually do have a lot of common ground on this issue. But we actually have to be talking to people on the other side to discover that. And one of the things that happened for me is that In fighting the battle here in Wisconsin and the conservative and libertarian grassroots, it became very quickly apparent to me that we have, unfortunately, a Republican leadership right now that that has zero will to do anything about getting rid of Common Core in the state of Wisconsin. And that's a hard reality, and and it's a difficult thing to have to say out loud. Um, But I think it's really important that we be very clear that that's the case. Um, Our governor is essentially committed to Common Core. He says some vague things in the press to indicate that he might want to get rid of this, but when you know the political um, inside baseball about what's going on up at the Capitol, it's very, very clear that he um, isn't really interested in seeing Common Core go anywhere. Um, You need to know that up front. Um, In addition to that, he's got uh, legislative leadership that work with him who are committed to ensuring that this doesn't go anywhere. So when Ruth is talking about her petition and getting rid of um, Luther Olson or uh, um, stopping him from being on committees, particularly the Senate Education Committee, um, that's really important because essentially Luther Olson right now is, is the fall guy for higher leadership. They're leaving him in place for a reason, and they have right now absolutely zero intention of removing him from the Senate Education Committee. That is the word up at the Capitol. Um, So they're going to say a lot of things and pretend like they're on our side and try and you know, make, it, make us think that they're doing the right thing, but the, the, the problem is that they're leaving all the people and situations in place to ensure that this doesn't go anywhere. At best right now, um, in my humble opinion, we are headed for a rebrand of Common Core, not a repeal. So it's really, really important that we understand that. Now, again, why would we talk to the left about this? Because we need critical mass in terms of political pressure. And right now, we do not have it. Um, That's why we are still plowing forward with uh, full implementation of Common Core in the state of Wisconsin. We do not have the the number of people. We do not have the volume uh, of uh, anger that we need, uh, of discontent. And so we need every person and everybody we can get. And frankly, 
we do have a lot in common with those on the left on this issue. Why? Well, it has to do with something you've heard me talk about before, if you've been to heard me, hear me speak here at uh, Fox Valley Conservative Forum in the past, and that is something called public-private partnership. How many uh, of you remember me talking about this topic um, at all in the past? Well, I see Bill's hand. <laughs> There's a few people whose hands are going up. Um, well, for those of you who do not know what public-private partnership is, let me take a few moments to just explain that. Uh, Public-private partnership is when big government and big business hold hands. There are lots of different words for this, lots of different phrases. Another is fascism. That's what it is. And unfortunately, on the right, on the, what we think of as the right, we have been sold a bill of goods for a long time. We have been told that if business is involved in finding the solution, then it must be a good thing. And unfortunately, that is a lie. It can be a good thing if business is involved, if business is involved alone. It is not a good thing when business is holding hands with big government. And that is what's happening with Common Core. When you look at the political spectrum, one of the things that you find is that there has been this very interesting specialization of concerns along the political spectrum. We often hear uh, people on the left talking about evil corporations. We hear them screaming about big business, don't we? That's, that's a very common cry on their side. And on our side, we scream about big government and the infringements of big government. Well, what if we were both right? And in fact, we are in this case. We are both right because it is big government and big uh, business holding hands. What happens when those entities hold hands? Well, they start to circumvent the rights and the voice of you and I. That's what happens. Decisions start getting made behind closed doors, and we lose our ability to have any say in anything. If you look at the way that Common Core was implemented across the United States, you will find that all of the decisions were made before people like you and I had a chance to hear anything about it or say anything about it or do anything about it, before we had even a chance to evaluate what it was and if it was worth the paper that it was printed on, and that's pretty much what it is. It's a plan printed on a piece of paper, and it's not very good. But it's a very detailed plan, and they're going to make us do it. That's, it's got now the force of law behind it and a lot of money. So it is going to take a lot to get rid of it. One of the first, actually the first essay uh, in the book, Common Ground on Common Core, is by Shane Vanderhart, who some of you may know from a variety of different online venues. He um, is a, 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 an education watchdog par excellence. And um, he really sets the tone for the book by explaining to people in detailed and well-researched terms uh, how Common Core uh, came to be, how it was so quickly uh, foisted on all of us. And it's really remarkable. I mean, he, he talks about um, school board, state school board meetings in um, a couple of different states and the fact that nobody, uh, and actually in, in some localities, um, some municipalities, nobody, nobody was standing up and saying no to this. It's what Beverly Ekman, another great education researcher, has referred to as the inside-out technique. And how this works is that big government and big business make these decisions behind closed doors, and they start implementing infrastructure behind closed doors, behind the scenes, under the radar, where you don't know about it. And they get it embedded to a point where it's going to be very, very difficult to get rid of before you've ever heard anything about it. And then they roll out a PR campaign to tell you how wonderful it's going to be and why we need it. That's what was done here. That's what was done. So if we're both right, the left and the right, if it's big government and big business, and we need to fight both, and we need to really fight them as a partnership in order to win this battle, then we really... It behooves us to be talking to the other side because they have information that we need and vice versa in order to be effective in fighting the battle. 
when you look at all of the, the information that the left, uh, some really good folks on the left have collected about the corporate aspects of Common Core, all of the corporate money that's involved, um, the, the um, interests um, that are in bed with each other here, um, it's pretty frightening. It's pretty astounding. But we wouldn't, I don't think we would know that as well unless we were listening to what they had to say. On the other hand, they, in, in some cases, have really forgotten that it's with the force of government that these corporations have been able to do what they've done. They are using, they are leveraging public policy in order to make this happen. And so when we start partnering up and sharing information, all kinds of good things can start to happen. Um, now, does that mean we're going to agree on everything? No, it doesn't. And the, and the preface to the book makes it very clear that we're going to have to have some very, very hard discussions with one another. Because just um, stopping Common Core isn't the end of the story. We have to figure out what else we do in order to have real education going on in this country. So there are some hard discussions ahead. But if we're honest with each other and if we're building relationships of trust with one another, it becomes infinitely more possible to have those discussions and have them be productive. Now, I know a lot of you in the room are probably still saying to yourselves, but Kirsten, really, really? I mean, how possible is it to have these discussions? How likely are these friendships to last? Um, how sincere could they possibly be? It's a legitimate question. But I'd like to tell you a couple of stories, a couple of personal stories, um, that I think illustrate that it, it is very possible. Uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, um, Jeff Horns, who some of you also know, Jeff is a, another activist in the Madison area. Jeff Horn and I were told by a mutual friend that we um, should think about meeting with a new dean of education at a local college, a local private college in the Madison area. Um, he had just been hired, uh, and he was also uh, one of the co-founders of something called the United Opt-Out National which is a, a, an organization um, essentially on the left that helps parents opt their kids out of the Common Core tests, the high stakes tests. And um, just incidentally, what do I mean when I say high stakes? I mean that teachers' jobs, their livelihoods are dependent on those tests. And unfortunately, with Common Core and No Child Left Behind, um, some of these other reform initiatives, we are teaching to the test. So we're not really educating children. We're not even really evaluating what they're learning. What we're doing is um, creating a system by which we can penalize teachers. This is not not real assessment of education. Um, So Tim uh, Slacker uh, is one of the co-founders of United Opt-Out National, and again, a new uh, dean of education at this local uh, private college in the Madison area. And Jeff and I said, well, okay, we'll talk to anybody. And so we went to have coffee with Tim. And we didn't know what to expect. We had no idea. And I think we were a little nervous. I'm quite sure Tim was probably a little nervous um, to show up at that meeting. Uh, But we sat down, and we had coffee together, and the most amazing thing happened. We found out that we liked each other. We had an amazing conversation, and we found out that we agreed on a ton about what real education could be and should be and what it would look like and how we could even get there. Um, He's very pro-public education. Um, I think that there are lots of different ways to get where we want to go. Um, So I'm not, that's not my only route there, in in my opinion. Again, there's lots of different ways. But we we had a fundamental agreement about what real education was. And it was not anything that was associated with Common Core. So that's a huge start, just to know that. And to find out that you like somebody, not just as a potential colleague um, in an initiative, but also as a person. Because you need to like people really like them if you're going to work with them over the long haul. That makes things a lot easier. So the next meeting that we had with Tim, he brought a friend. He brought one of his colleagues from this little college, a guy named Jed Hopkins. And we found out we liked him, too. And he liked us. And this little group started to grow. And it was pretty exciting. And when I decided that I was going to do this book, they were the first two people that I went to and said, would you contribute something? 
because I knew that they would feel strongly and that they would have something important to say as educators of educators, and that's what they are. And a, and a huge part of our problem is in the schools of education. Um, they make the point in their essay, their dialogue, that essentially the ability that we have to talk about education, how we talk about it, has been very, very limited. That we don't even really have the freedom to say, you know, or educators in particular don't have the freedom to say what they want or what they think or what they feel about what's going on in education and what it should be and what it shouldn't. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, and then I started gathering other people to be in this book. And it was a, the most amazing process that you can possibly imagine. Um, there, I mean, I have conservatives. I have social conservatives. I have um, libertarians. I have voluntarists. I have objectivists. I have people who identify as radical leftists. I have people who identify as, uh, of mo as moderate Democrats. Um, it's, it's a whole, it really is everybody that you can possibly think of in this book. And they all fundamentally agree that Common Core is bad and it's got to go. And that it is worth talking to, quote unquote, all the wrong people in order to make it happen. Um, one of the other women that uh, is in the book is um, a professor at a little college out in Maryland. And she, um, she is one of the, the most uh, hopeful um, examples that I can think of, of the kinds of friendships that can be formed as well. Um, Morna McDermott is her name, and I um, have come to just really love and admire Morna. She's very, again, very, very pro-public education, is a real fighter on that issue, another member of United Opt Out National, uh, founding member. And she, um, <laughs> this, is, this is the problem. We haven't been talking to each other. We don't know who each other are. We haven't known. We've, we've been purposely pitted against each other. And who does that benefit? It doesn't benefit us if we're not talking to each other. It benefits the people in Washington. It benefits the corporate partners who are pushing Common Core. It benefits the people in Madison who don't want to bother with this or don't want this to go anywhere. That's who it benefits if we're not talking to each other. It benefits all the wrong people. It does not benefit us. So when Marna, Marna and I started talking, I think she and I both had a lot of misconceptions about what the other person believed. And some of that was coming out in, uh, in the drafts that she was handing me for her essay. And as I very carefully took time to talk with her and, and send her feedback on her essay, we started to dialogue more and more about what I believed and what she believed. And I'll tell you what, by the end of um, that first round of dialogue, she was smiling and I was smiling. And she said, Kirsten, when this is all over, I have to meet you in person. I have to meet you in person. I understand so much better now. And one of the things that she had not understood is that the Tea Party and the Liberty Movement is not a monolithic thing. That we're just a bunch of people and loose-knit groups and sometimes not knit together at all. That sometimes we're, we're off in our own corners doing our own thing. But, you know, she bought all the rhetoric in the media about who and what the Tea Party is. And I was able to help her understand that, you know what, it's not a monolithic thing. It's just a lot of really concerned people who are trying to get the right things done. And she wrote back to me when she read that, and she said, Kirsten, I get it. I get it. And she said, not only do I get it, I appreciate it. Because when people talk about the left, quote unquote, the left as this monolithic thing, she said, it makes my skin crawl because we're not a monolithic thing either. And that's one of the things that I've discovered in doing this book, is that there are all kinds of lefties, and some of them don't like government getting in their face or in their business any more than you and I do. There's just different biases on both sides. Where I might trust business a little more, they might try to trust the government a little more. But it doesn't mean they trust the government a lot, right? So when we start talking to each other, we start to figure these things out. And again, it doesn't mean we're going to agree about everything, but it does mean that we can start to agree about some really important things that we, we already actually agreed on, we just didn't know we did. It's really, really important. And when you look at the situation in Wisconsin, that relationship is going to be vital. Why? 
because in other states, we're all, they are already challenged. It's already hard to get the left and the right talking. But in Wisconsin, because of everything we've been through in the last few years, it's even harder. But w unless we do, this is not going away. We need the critical mass. And because we have leadership who's not interested in removing this right now, um, essentially, we are going to have to leverage the full Im implementation and the anger that is going to come with the full implementation of Common Core to not only be talking across the aisle, but be talking effectively to the people at the Capitol. What do I mean when I say leverage full implementation? That's a hard, it's, it, it sort of even makes me um, queasy to say it. It's a little bit along the lines of what Rahm Emanuel said, never waste a good crisis. This is the situation we're in. Implementation is happening as you and I speak. We tried over the last year or year and a half to get our legislators and our governor to listen. We pointed to New York and to Kentucky where this mess has already gone in. And we saw the screaming and we tried to point out the screaming and we tried to point out the disaster that was going on with kids and teachers and parents and taxpayers in these other states where early implementation had been embraced. And we sent open letter after open letter after open letter. Some of you may have seen some of them. They were all released to the news wires. It didn't do a bit of good, except for one thing. It did finally get us. One of the things that it did help to get us is a set of public hearings for the first time on Common Core in this state, which had not happened previous to that. So we were able to make some headway on political pressure. We were able to get some things done. But ultimately, after those hearings, what happened? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. They, they basically just felt like, okay, well, we've given you what you wanted. You know, we've, we've had a series of hearings, and now we're just going to plow forward. That's what they did. And every bit of helpful legislation that we possibly could have, could have gotten passed was quashed by legislative leadership. And, um, and Luther Olson was sort of the linchpin in all of that. They used him pretty heavily. Well... As implementation goes in here in Wisconsin, we are going to see the kinds of things that have happened in New York and in Kentucky. And it's going to get ugly. And the first people that it's going to get ugly for are the groups that I mentioned previously, children, students, and teachers. Teachers are on the front lines. They are the ones having to implement this in their classrooms. They're the ones who are having to proctor the tests. They are the ones who are having to prepare their children uh, their, their classrooms for those tests. And again, what are the tests? They are not an evaluation of what the children are learning. As a matter of fact, they couldn't possibly be because we're testing more and more and more and more and we're actually learning now less and less and less and less in the classroom. So there's less learning taking place, more <coughs> testing, and the testing isn't even valid. Were any of you in Germantown um, last weekend to um, hear Gary Thompson speak, Sandra Stosky and Gary Thompson. One of the things that Gary Thompson, Dr. Gary Thompson, who's a psychologist out in Utah, has been so brave and bold in uh, unveiling is the fact that there is no validity to these tests. Zero. And if it were you or I doing this to children, we would go to jail because it's not legal to give tests that have not been piloted, that have not been properly validated. But that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And why are we doing it? Well, because it gives, a whole, it gives government control and it gives corporations access to a lot of money. And what else? Data. And what does the data do? Data provides access to even more money. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But we are going to see more screaming, because as these tests get done, as the uh, kinds of homework that um, are being offered um, through Common Core um, start to really take root, um, the, the kinds of learning approaches that are used, uh, the embedded pedagogy that's in these standards, don't ever let anybody tell you that these are just standards. That's a lie. 
When you pair standards and tests, you drive curriculum. This is a closed loop. It is a standards curriculum testing closed loop. And it's designed to be that way. It's designed to be a self-perpetuating system. So as this goes in, and as the children are put under more and more stress from these tests, more and more stress from these uh, learning approaches, many of which are frankly developmentally inappropriate and damaging to, to especially children at younger ages, um, we are going to see the kinds of things that we've seen in New York. Another of the essays in the book is by a woman named Mary Calamia, who's a social worker, a licensed social worker in the state of New York on Long Island. And Mary uh, talks about the uptick in her personal, uh, her professional practice after uh, Common Core full implementation went in in New York. And the kinds of things that she talks about, the things that she started to see will break your heart, literally break your heart. We're talking about children cutting. We're talking about children having to sleep with their parents again because they're so uncomfortable and afraid. We're talking about uh, children wetting the bed. Um, we're talking about uh, p people not being, children not being able to get through class periods. I mean, it's really difficult for these kids what is going on. And when you pile on top of that the fact that teachers are literally being told now what they will teach and how they will teach it, there is no escape. You know, where before a teacher might have been able to say, well, look, I'll, I'll give them this much, and then you know it'll make them think that I'm kind of going along, but behind the scenes, I'll do this and this and this and this to keep my kids on the right track, to keep my students okay. They can't do it anymore. There's no room. There's no wiggle room. And frankly, their, again, their livelihoods, their jobs in many cases are now tied to performance on these tests, which, again, have no validity. So kids are going to start screaming. Parents will start screaming when their kids start screaming. Teachers are going to start screaming. Right now, there's a lot of teachers in this state who aren't yet screaming for one of two reasons. One, because they're afraid, because their jobs are now tied to all of this. That makes it very scary to speak up. But in addition, because of everything we've been through, there's a, in some cases a knee-jerk reaction. And some of the vague things that the governor has said in, in the press have led people to believe that he's now against Common Core. And they don't know the inside baseball. And so for them, it's just straight reactionism. It's just, OK, well, if the governor is you know, against this, then I'm for it. There is some of that going on. And it is difficult for us where, again, it would already be difficult to get left and right talking in other states. It's going to be more difficult here. But it has to happen, and it is starting to happen. And I believe that as the pain level rises in this state, people are going to be more and more willing to do that. So we know where we are in Wisconsin. We know where we need to get to, which is to get Common Core gone. It has to be gone. It can't be a rebrand. It has to just be gone. There's no fixing this thing. It's got to go away. Well, how do we get there? Again, we have to start talking to each other, but how do we make that work if we're not used to talking to people on the other side? Well, let me tell you kind of what I did in terms of putting this book together. I made a conscious commitment that I would strip partisan language out of the book, out of every single essay. And I, when I approached authors, I said, here's my idea. I'm going to edit you very carefully when you hand me your draft to make sure that everything in your essay is something that everybody who reads it is going to be able to at least consider. They may not agree with everything you say at the end, but they will at least give you a fair hearing. And that's what we did. Every single author in this book was willing to submit themselves to that kind of editing. And it's not that you can't tell where some of these people stand along the political spectrum. You can. Some of them, it's very clear. But they framed their arguments in such a way that anybody can hear them. Anybody consider, can consider what they have to say. And that's so important. So when we start talking to our neighbors, when we start talking to our friends, our coworkers, and we're going to have to start talking to all of those people if we're going to get where we need to go, we're going to have to strip the partisan rhetoric and lingo out of our speech. 
And we're also going to have to start doing something that you may have heard me say in here before, and that is ask questions. How many of you, have you, have you ever heard me talk about how the brain handles questions versus statements? This is a really important point, and it's very valuable for any conversation that you would ever have, not just with somebody on the other side. It could be important with your spouse or your child. <laughs> um, when you hear a statement, you align to that statement in a split second based on what's already programmed into your subconscious. Most of what we do, in fact, is not driven by the conscious mind. It's driven by what's already programmed back here. I wish, I wish it were a little different. I wish we were more you know, conscious, rational, logical creatures, but that's not how we are. Things get programmed in, and in a split second we align based on what is comfortable, based on what's programmed back here. But a question must be evaluated. The brain can't do anything else with a question. It needs to evaluate it. It's a little bit like planting a virus in a computer, and it starts to undo programming. You have to think. You have to process. And I'm not talking about gotcha questions. We can't be asking those because the brain knows the difference. The brain knows when, when you're coming for it. <laughs> it needs to be a conversational, legitimate, honest, open question. You know, when I uh, started talking to Morna, for example, one of the, the questions that I asked her is, can you tell me your definition of social justice? Because she's a big social justice person. I said, help me understand your definition of social justice, not what the media tells me, not what uh, you know, the corporatists who uh, are pushing Common Core tell me, not what you know, government tells me. What is your definition of, of social justice? And she explained it to me. And while I don't necessarily agree with all aspects of her definition um, in terms of you know, whether I would jump on board that train, it was a lot less offensive to me, her definition of social justice, than anything that has been coming at me from anybody else. And I thought, wow, I can at least respect why she would want to go down that road. So it's understanding and trust that we're building. Again, we don't have to agree with each other about everything. That's not the point. But we do have to create a foundation <laughs> for dialogue and for partnering together. And in this fight, we are going to have to be committed to each other. And it's really hard to be committed to each other if you don't have a relationship of trust. If you don't take the time to get to know people and get to like them and understand them, even if you don't agree. I mean, look, I don't agree with my sister about everything. I don't agree with my dad about everything. I'm sure as heck not going to agree with you know, my neighbor or you know, a coworker about anything. And I'm definitely not going to agree with somebody on, uh, on what we think of as the left about everything but I can agree with them about a lot if I just have a conversation. Again, we've been pitted against each other. We've been told that Common Core, because business is involved, is a free market solution. Is that true? No, it's not even vaguely true. They've also used social justice against the left. They've, they've used that term, and it's basically what they've done the, the people who have forged this relationship is they've sold out the entire political spectrum for their own gain, their own gain of power and their own gain of money. And who's at the, who's at the center of that? Who are the pawns in the middle of that? Again, children. Those are the primary pawns in this game, and that's ugly, and it's got to stop. Um, I am willing to take questions if anybody wants to throw any out to me. Yeah, go ahead. What big businesses are behind Common Core? Um, the largest single contributor, uh, the private single contributor to the Common Core, the, the development and advancement of Common Core state standards is the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so, my, And Microsoft has a huge stake in this. Why uh, does Microsoft have a stake in this? Anybody want to render a guess? It's software and it's and hardware. Yeah, absolutely. They do they do both, um, but primarily software. And there's a lot of money to be made on the 21st century classrooms and the testing apparatus and the the testing software and all of this stuff. The the IT infrastructure um, that Doesn't Bill Gates still own a little Microsoft stock. Um, I think he probably does. <laughs> um, Cisco 
is another big um, stakeholder in this. They've been pushing it. IBM is a huge pusher of Common Core. There are a number of technology companies. Um, also, education-related um, companies. So Pearson, which owns something ridiculous like 80, what is it, 80, 90 percent of the education um, text textbook market, um, and a lot of the software as well. Go ahead, Bill. Question: How do you uh, how do you counter the discussionary point when people say, "Well, shouldn't corporations be allowed to be involved in their local community and helping their local uh, schools?" Because that's I think a lot of times what people will counter with. Mm -hmm. how do you <coughs> Well, I don't, I don't have any problem with, um, for example, the idea of uh, businesses uh, being involved in what kids in their community um, can learn, but I don't want those decisions being made behind closed doors. I don't want government and business partnering to make those decisions. I want a, a, an actual representative process going on via which you and I still have full control of the process. It has to be transparent. It has to be representative. Yes, go ahead. Yes, um, when I go down to the Capitol with my uh, partial list of grievances against the Obama administration, and uh, the capital, crazy capital singers are out there, and uh, I get to talking to them and everything, um, the whole Madison crowd, we get talking about the Bilderbergers and the Illuminati. And all that. And I, some of my things I hate it when they agree with me, <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's a good way to like you say you got to talk to them. Yeah, I mean, there's we end up agreeing about a lot of things, you know, that I. Right. Absolutely. And, and I do think that par public-private partnership is at the root of a lot of the big problems that we have today. When you start looking at uh, health care, you know, what's the Obamacare exchanges, that's, a, that's an unholy relationship between business and government as well. Um, you know, what about, um, you know, things? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I saw your hand, and so I, if I, I'm not going to blather if somebody's got a question. But, but there's, a, there's a ton that is going on that is actually rooted in public-private partnership that are things that are causing us big problems. Um, right here you know, in our state, um, I can think of several of them. We've talked about green tier in this room before. That's public-private partnership. Um, I can you know, point at the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. That's public-private partnership. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, go ahead. I think one of the biggest problems uh, about everything that we discuss in the arena of politics and businesses, we never use anything other than politically correct language. Mm -hmm. Public-private public partnership, that sounds so nice, but it's actually mm -hmm. kind of cool. It is. Nice. Yeah. But everything, if you, when you get it down to its essence, that's the only way you're going to be promoting for it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, the reason that I find public-private partnership to be such a valuable term as I talk to people, and it, you're right, it does sound kind of nice and less horrible than fascism, <laughs> is that it does get in, a, in a sort of a word picture at the two sides of the partnership. Um, what's really who's shaking hands to make things happen? And I think when you're talking to people on the other side of the you know divide along the political spectrum, that tends to be very valuable. Um, so you can say, look, yeah, you know, you're totally right. You know, the corporations the, that are involved in this are in the wrong. They're they are evil. They're being evil. Um, but look at how they're doing it. They're doing it via the thing that I'm afraid of which is intrusive government. They're doing it via public policy. They're using the force of government to get their way. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can you give me some brief explanation as to why these tests are causing children such psychological trauma? What's, what's, what are the tests doing to these kids? Why? Well, part of it is just the sheer amount of testing that is going on. Um, over the years and the various iterations of uh, education reform, uh, at the national level, we've seen an increase of testing, um, sort of slowly ramping up. Actually, not even so slowly, but under No Child Left Behind, it was, it was already pretty bad, but um, Common Core is essentially uh, No Child Left Behind on steroids. And you may have heard that before, but it's, it's actually true. Um, so now we're not just um, testing kids you know, every few grades. We're testing them pretty much every grade. So they're getting these, these major, important, summative tests 
uh, in almost in almost every grade. Plus, they're getting formative tests, which means they're basically being tested every day in the classroom in, in, in a standardized way to ensure that the things are on track in the classroom. I mean, this is Leviathan. It's Leviathan. Do you guys know? <laughs> it's like this, it's monster-like. It's horrible. It's got so many tentacles, and it just doesn't stop. Yeah, go ahead. Are there any uh, conservative organizations that are really fighting um, for or businesses, conservative businesses that are fighting? Um, I don't know of any conservative businesses that are fighting it so much. I mean, I know plenty who are, you know, all on board. And frankly, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, which is one of our most powerful trade organizations in this state, is fully on board and released, put out a press release, I believe, in February, saying that they embraced and endorsed Common Core. Endorsed? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, go ahead, um, Ed. I'm not sure this is going to be a, a question as much as a statement for you to comment on. Um, you know, Tony Urso got a hold of me uh, yesterday and asked me to do a press release, which I'm going to give to you shortly. And in the um, press release, what came out uh, yesterday was uh, Senator Olson's chief of staff has, as of yesterday, become a lobbyist, full-time staffer for the Department of Public Administration. Or instruction. Is it an instruction? Or is it, yeah, yeah, instruction. instruction. Yeah. I said so the, um, you were talking about public and private uh, issues. Uh, you know, well, here you've got public and public. Mm-hmm. Here you've got somebody who has fought with Senator Olson to stop Senate Bill 619 from going forward, now becoming the chief lobbyist for the DPI. So I wonder what your comment would be when you talk about you know, public, public type of issues. Um, I'm, I am very much aware of the situation that you're talking about, and um, it's it's incredibly disturbing. Um, the conflicts of interest that exist uh, for Senator Olson alone are very troubling indeed. Uh, he's married to uh, the head of CESA 6, uh, which is essentially a regional government for schools. Um, and, and, and on top of that, now, yeah, his chief of staff was just elevated to this lobbyist position. So he will have the inside track uh, at CISA. He will have the inside track at DPI. Um, this is pretty ugly. What's going on? As long as he remains chairman right. of the Senate Education Committee yes. or vice chairman, either one. Correct. And that's what I would hope people understand, why you have to understand that Senator Olson has to be removed from the authority he has had over state education. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, just to, to let you know, um, there are going to be games played with that. I mean, they may switch him to another committee, but it will be another, they will want to switch him to another powerful committee where he can do potentially as much or more damage. Is anybody running against him? Um, he's not up, he's for, not up for election right now. Election now. Two years out. Yep, it's, been, it's a little while yet. Um, but in any event, this is a huge problem. And, and again, look at what's happening. Is legislative leadership, is Republican leadership moving him out of the way? No. They're keeping him exactly where he is. So that tells you everything you need to know about what, about what leadership, Republican leadership in this state wants, really, in terms of Common Core. We have to start getting savvy, friends, about differentiating words from actions. We have bought words for far, far, far too long. And I understand that there are emotional connections that develop to parties and that there are emotional connections that develop to particular politicians, personalities. We need to ditch it all. We need to be discerning and we need to stand on principle. It is that simple. Yeah, David. You're going to hate me for this, but... What is your basic synopsis of what real education looks like? Maybe a comparison contrast. Well, it is not testing kids ceaselessly in the classroom and causing them like so much stress that they uh, feel the need to cut or wet the bed. Um, it is not uh, asking them to do close reading or other you know kinds of like I mean really both in terms of English language arts and mathematics there's so much bad stuff that's developmentally inappropriate for young children in particular it is not foisting uh, stuff on kids you know when they're not ready for it it's not pretending that a young brain is ready to do something that it's not 
You know, you, you can't make a fish fly. You can't. You just can't. So when the child's brain is ready, great. You know, give them, give them the challenges that are appropriate to them at their age level. And there's plenty of evidence to, to indicate what those, you know, appropriate challenges are. We are way outside of the bounds on those with Common Core. So what, that's what it's not, David, to be really, you know, clear. That's what it's not for me. What is it? Um, I think that depends on the child. And I think it depends on the parent. And I think it depends on the teacher that they choose to trust to help them navigate the process. You know, if you're, if you're homeschooling, then, you know, chances are you as a parent are the primary decider of what is going to be good for your kid. If you are in a position where you can't homeschool and you've got to put your child in a public school or a private school, um, then, gosh, you know, you still should have a ton of say as a parent. You should have, frankly, all the say as a parent about how your child learns. You, as Gary Thompson has said, are basically the CEO of your kids. You know them better than anybody. You know how they're going to learn. Not every kid learns the same. Another essay in the book is by a woman who has, a, has two children, one of whom is, uh, has learning differences. And she talks about what this is going to do to not all kids, really, but in particular kids with learning differences. And it's going to essentially emotionally and psychologically kill them. It's going to damage them profoundly. So what are we doing? Are we, are we allowing other people to dictate how our kids learn? Or are we going to stand up and say, no, we are the masters of how our children will, will learn. We know them better. We are in the best position to determine how they learn, why, when they will learn, what they will learn, and frankly, to protect them in that way and give them the best possible educational experience and the best possible future going forward. So... One more. Kirsten, there are flyers from the Germantown rally back there. The rally will be put on the website. It isn't there yet, and there's more information for anybody that didn't attend the rally who's still interested in learning more about Common Core. Pick up one of those, and please sign the petition to take Luther Olson out. Absolutely. Let's send a message to leadership in Madison. We are not going to be content with the status quo. They've got to go. And thank you for all your work on, on that petition, Ruth. Let's give her a hand for that. Wrap it up. Yep, thank you. You can give another round of applause for Kirsten. <laughs>